So, how do you vegetable tan fur on hides without the hair falling out, without hair slipping or shedding? Okay, that's the question I'm going to answer in today's little chalkboard class. This is a really common question. This is a problem that a lot of people run into. I would say a problem that most people run into when first vegetable tanning, aka bark tanning, fur hides, fur on leather. Um, and I will just give a context preamble just to say that I do consider fur tanning, so tanning fur on leather, to be the hardest kind of tanning. That's just me. That's my opinion. Um, as someone who does all different all different kinds and styles of tanning, fur tanning I consider to be the hardest, okay? Because it's the most sensitive, right? Because yes, it's easy to lose a hair, to lose fur. So you have to be the most attentive to the hides and the most thorough. Almost you have to almost be the most nitpicky, the most attentive and thorough when you're tanning furs, okay? So for one, don't give yourself a hard time if you have hair slippage on hides, okay? Because it is hard, it is hard. Um, but these are, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through the list of reasons why I don't experience hair slippage. Slipping or slippage is just the word that means when hair falls out of a hide, okay? so. These reasons why, in general, I don't experience fur slippage. Um, it's not something I stress out about. It's really not something I expect on my hides. It's not an issue for me, pretty much, at all these days. Um, and that wasn't the case when I was learning, certainly. So all of these, this kind of method I use now was born from lots of trial and error and lots of heartbreak and lots of hides slipping their fur you know, over the years and me just finding a groove over time and noticing what worked and what didn't. I'm gonna pause and just say, get it out of the way, that yes, pickling is an extra step that you can do with fur hides. I do talk about it in some depth in the video, busting 10 myths about vegetable tanning. Um, so you can look at that video. But I will just say that yes, you can pickle hides. It's an optional step. It's something people do to help ensure against hair loss. That's the purpose of this step. It's an extra acidifying step that you do before you put a hide in tannin solution. And I don't pickle. I pickle 0% of the time. And to be honest, I have no need to pickle and no desire to pickle and I really don't or see myself at any point in my lifetime really, I don't think so. I don't really, I don't, I don't feel it um, really needing to pickle. So I'm just gonna say, yeah, that's an option if you wanna go that route and you don't need to. So if you follow these steps, which is just to be attentive, pay attention, really learn the nuances of your hides, um, you can definitely get over, get over the hair slipping hump, okay? <laughs> so here's, Here's what I do. So number one, this is really crucial and very important, and it's not what you're going to want to hear, especially if you pick up roadkill and you're just getting into processing animals. Number one is when I'm tanning furs, I'm only choosing hides that are very fresh to begin with. Okay, what that means is that the hair is very, very tight to begin with. When hair doesn't fall out or shed out at all. You know, if I like do this to fur and kind of gently pull and tug, if zero hair sheds out or pulls out, we call that tight. I call the hair tight. And when an animal dies on a dead body, fur slipping is the very first sign of skin starting to rot. It happens very quickly. It happens sooner than foul smell will happen, then it happens sooner than discoloration will happen. It's the very first sign of a skin starting to decompose and break down. Okay, so what that means is that 
when I've got a body. And I'm a person, trust me, I'm not like going around being super picky, but like, oh, I want that animal, I don't want that animal. Like, I am salvaging dead animals and hides from all over the place, okay? Um, it's just a matter of when I have a body, um, I'm pulling on the hair all over the body, very gently, just with the friction of my fingertips, feeling the hair all over the animal, particularly on the belly, like right around the navel, which is right over the intestines, okay? That's where I'm always feeling the hair first, okay? Because of all the places on the body, the hair will start slipping from the belly first, typically, okay? Because the guts start to rot first, so the skin starts to rot at the belly first, okay? so. You know, in the wintertime, yes, uh, an animal's body or a hide could be one or two or three or four or five or six days old, and the hair can still be really, really tight. It, de it just depends on temperature, mainly, and other factors, okay? So when I am assessing an animal's body or a hide, I'm pulling on all that fur, if it's all super tight all over the animal, including the belly, I'm like, wow, yeah, this hide is in really good shape, it's fresh. This whole animal's body is probably in really good shape. I bet all the meat is great. Um, I'm gonna, when I skin this animal, I'm gonna tan this fur hair on, okay? If there's any degree of slippage already happening in the, in the fur, in the hide on an animal, I just automatically reserve it for, hey, nope, this isn't gonna be a fur. I'm gonna tan this as hair off leather. I make the decision just like that, okay? There is no magical way to get hair follicles to stick back into a skin once the hair follicles have rotted, okay? <laughs> like, I'm all about magic. Everything I do is alchemy, and I don't know an alchemy for that. Maybe it exists. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. But overall, in general, in my normal life, in the real world, I'm telling you, get over it. <laughs> get over the need to like make sure the hair stick, try to get the hair to stick back in. It just doesn't happen, okay? There's so many hides out there. A hair off leather is going to be so beautiful and magical on its own. My god, I mean even, even if it's something amazing like a fox or a coyote, like can you imagine like coyote leather hair off, like a coyote skin pouch? It's freaking magical no matter what you do, so get over it. Um, and if you if you are on my Patreon and follow, if you're on the extra videos a month supporter on my Patreon, what I'm talking about right now is everything that I demonstrate in detail on the tanning process video number one, which is assessing um, a hide and a whole body for fur slippage. Okay, so that's number one. That's really important. Okay, so you know if you choose a hide that's already starting to slip meaning that bacterial activity has already begun in the skin at the level of the hair follicles. The hair follicles are already starting to rot. You're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up to stress yourself out. It takes more labor to tan a fur than it does to tan a hair off leather. So you're going to end up putting in a lot of labor and care to this hide that is not going to turn out well as a fur. Don't set yourself up for failure. It's not good for your self-esteem. It's not good for your tanning practice, okay? So that's number one. There's a reason that's number one. It's the most important, okay? Fresh, fresh hide. Fresh hide. Okay, make sure that hide is fresh. So for the most part, for me, that means most of the time I'm just using hides from animals I get in the cold half of the year, you know, late fall, winter, early spring. Because um, that's like bodies last longer in the cold. I'm not saying that um, you can't tan furs from other times of the year. But usually for me, it's like um, if they're butchered animals, like domestic rabbits that were all like butchered, even if it's the summertime, butchered all at once, the hides were put right in the freezer or salted and dried right away. You know, they didn't lay on a hot, sunny roadside. For half a day okay so and you know in the winter time is when most mammals have thicker fur coats right because they grow in thicker coats in order to stay warmer so then the, the, the fur hides are actually nicer um, 
and warmer for your own garments. So it's worth it. Just everything about furs and the cold season fits together and makes sense. Embrace it. Go with that flow. Go with that seasonal just symphony there. Everything about it is good. All right, so number two is to membrane your fur hides very well before you put them in tannin solution. Membrane as thoroughly as you can. If you don't know what membrane is, watch my Tanning Classroom 101 video where I talk about all the steps, sorry, all the layers of the skin. Okay, so in order to membrane a hide very thoroughly before you put it in tannin solution, that does entail drying the hide first. So I couldn't make that two numbers, but I'll just put them together, you know. Um, so to dry the fur hide, obviously you, f you flesh the hide first. You skin it, you flesh it, meaning removing all the, the muscle tissue and fat and stuff like that. Fleshing doesn't take off the membrane for the most part. It just doesn't. So then I'm drying the hide. You can use salt or not use salt. Just get the thing dried. Dried swiftly, <laughs> you know? And don't let it dry slowly or else the hide's gonna rot and the hair's gonna fall out. So if it's a cloudy day, damp, rainy, salt that thing, salt that hide, okay? If you've got a beautiful dry sunny day and you can just stretch out that hide and have it in the sun so that it will dry in a couple of hours, yes, go for it! Or by a wood stove, if it's nice and dry, hang it up in front of the wood stove, great! If, if you don't have a great dry heat source like the sun or a wood stove, salt that hide or freeze it, something, okay? You gotta have it dry quickly, okay? Or it's gonna rot just like sun drying tomatoes. Okay, so dry the hide. Um, so drying the hide and then doing what I call dry membraning, which is just what I call the step. So. I just made a video, I describe this step in detail um, and show you on a red fox. So that video is called membraning dried fur hides or dry membraning, something like that. So on the dried hide, I'm using a stone and I'm buffing the entire membrane side of the hide. And you'll get up all these pa peely, papery layers of skin will come off. You'll be shocked, You're like, whoa, I didn't know all that was on there. Okay, it's really important to get that off. Why? Okay, it's important because membrane is a layer of skin, therefore it's made up of protein fibers, just like all the other layers of the skin. But the membrane, the fibers are distinct, they're unique, um, they're different from the core fiber layers. So yes, membrane will tan. Tannins will chemically bond to the protein fibers of the membrane just as much as they will bond to all the protein fibers of the core layer, core fiber layer of the skin. However, in order for the tannins to tan through the membrane layer, uh, it takes longer, okay? So a hide that has an intact membrane layer on it or patches of intact membrane is gonna take a lot longer to tan in tanning solution, okay? Because first the tannins have to tan their way through the membrane, which takes a while. Then they get all the way through the membrane and then they start tanning the core fibers of the skin, okay? So, you know, without that membrane, you know, you maybe like can get rid of an extra week of tanning time, okay? So on furs, that's really important, okay? Because the, the faster you tan that skin, what I mean is the faster that tannins bond to all the skin fibers through the full width of the skin, which happens on both sides. The tannins penetrate through the skin on the top and the bottom, and they slowly work their way through the full width of the skin until they meet in the middle, okay? That's the whole point 
of taking cross cut sections of a hide. You know, you take you take a knife and you cut a little sliver of the thickest part of the skin and you're peering inside. You're looking in the width of the skin to see if pigment uh, has moved all the way through the full width of the fibers yet or not, or if there's still a bluish white strip of rawhide in the middle. Okay, so as soon as the skin fibers around the hair follicles tan, the hair is permanently affixed. It is stuck on there for friggin' ever. Good luck trying to pull that shit out. I mean, honestly, if you change your mind and I'm like, oh, I'm actually, I want a hair off leather. Good freaking luck. You're not getting that hair off. I mean, vegetable tanning is actually, inc it's incredible how well tannins preserve fur how well they preserve and tighten the hair in the, in the leather. It's awesome, it's awesome. Um, but, so the sooner that happens, the, so, the, the more quickly the full width of the skin tans through, the sooner you're in the safe zone, okay? The sooner you're out of the risk zone of the hair falling out, right? Because it's just a skin basically in water, basically in a tea, okay? Tannin, yes, tannins are very antiseptic. Yes, they are. A hide can still rot in tannins because remember, it only takes a teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny bit of bacterial activity to start to happen in the skin for hair follicles to rot, okay? It's just a teeny, weeny, weeny bit, okay? So, Right, so if you can get that hide to tan in five days instead of two months, <laughs> choose the five days, right? Because that's just going to really eliminate um, the risk of your hair slipping, okay? So one of the most important ways to do that is to membrane as thoroughly as you can before the hide goes in tannin solution because it's going to tan a lot faster um, and a lot more evenly good stuff. It's very, very important. Okay, so the third one, huge deal, huge, huge, huge deal. Keep your tannin solutions very, very, very strong. So strong. Keep them, I would, I call it violently strong from beginning to end. Okay? <laughs> Never let your solutions get weak. Don't do that bullshit of starting off your solutions really weak in order to ease the hide into a strong solution. Throw that bullshit out the window! It does not apply to small fur hides. It doesn't even apply to most deer hides, okay? Keep that tannin solution strong, okay? Tannins, if you're an herbalist, you already know, tannins are an antiseptic. They are, they're incredibly effective as a preservative. That's what they're doing to the leather. They're making skin, which is not a shelf-stable material, they're turning it into an in incredibly preserved material that could honestly, if cared for, last hundreds of years. I mean, that's amazing. Tannins are amazing. They keep bugs away. They keep mildew away. They're fucking incredible. Tannins are amazing. If you've ever done any, like, combination tanning, um, you know, like I've done it before. I've even read of, I think years ago, I think I remember in the Stephen Edholm and Tamara Wilder book, The Ancient Art of Brain Tanning, which is about buckskin. I feel like in there they mentioned that they had the experience as well, that when they would get a little bit of tannins accidentally mixed into their brain slurries or their egg slurries, that the brain slurry would last a whole nother day in the hot sun without going rancid and smelling disgusting, just from the little bit of tannins in there. And I totally experienced that too with eggs. Like years ago, the first time I like dipped a deer hide in tannins for 20 minutes and wrung it out and then dipped it in and then soaked it in the eggs and wrung it out, softened it. So just a little bit of tannins that had transferred you know, into the egg mixture, the eggs didn't go bad. Like, it was like two or three days later, and they still hadn't gone bad, which, you know, raw egg goes bad 
really fast and it smells really bad. You know when it's gone bad. Um, so that's the power of tannins as a preservative. They're pretty freaking amazing, okay? Take advantage of that. Take advantage of that. So for one, the stronger your concentration of tannins, the more antiseptic your bucket is, okay? And number two, the stronger the concentration of tannins, the faster your hide will tan, okay? If you, like, imagine, like, that's a bucket, okay? <laughs> imagine it's filled with tanning solution, okay? And those are just little molecules of tannins, okay? Tannin molecules suspended in water molecules, okay? If there's like five little tannin molecules, you know, they're moving around, they're moving, okay? Every time one of those tannin molecules just kind of runs into a protein fiber, so runs into the skin, it's gonna bond chemically, like, like a key in a lock. It's gonna bond permanently. And then like another little tannin molecules floating around, hits the skin, bonds, okay? So imagine there's only like a few tannin molecules floating around in there. You know, that height is tanning really slowly because it's like, oh, one tannin bonds, two tannin bonds, three. Imagine there's like a million bajillion jillion tannin molecules in there, you know, like, like it's just so full that there's just a million of them. So just by merit of them moving around, tannin molecules are contacting, literally bombarding the skin at an exponentially higher rate, okay? So the more concentrated the level of tannins is in this water solution, the much faster your hide will tan. And it is dramatic, okay? It makes a big, big difference. Okay, so I make very strong, when tanning fur hides, I'm always boiling my leaves or barks because that enables me to have the most control over making a super, super strong solution and I can make a solution in 12 hours where I'm boiling the leaves, you know, putting a lid on it, letting the pot sit overnight. Okay, and then I get a super strong, ready to go solution, you know, within a day. It's a big deal. It's very important. Okay, so then, you know, there's many other facets to that number three point. One is that it depends what your hide is, you know? So if your hide is a large hide or it's thick, it's going to be eating up a lot of tannins very quickly. So, um, you know, if you have a large hide that you're tanning such that the tannin levels are really dipping as the hide tans because they're being eaten up by the hide, then you need to really, really pay attention to sh refreshing and strengthening that solution as the fur hide tans all the way to the end because you want that bucket of solution to start off day one extra strong and you want it to be extra strong the entire time until at the end it is extra strong okay you want to try to avoid like low dips as much as you possibly can for me that means I'm tasting my tannin solutions every day I'm a taster okay I have probably tasted a million bajillion buckets of tanning solution at this point in my life is that dangerous yes don't just do it haphazard, okay? I have my methods, and one of them is that I'm very strict about fresh hides, I'm very strict about extra strong solutions, and um, I just kind of know at this point like when it's safe for me to taste tannin solutions and not. So I'm not just saying, like, it's a free-for-all. Just go taste all the solutions you want. You won't get sick. I'm not saying that. Use common sense. This is planet Earth. Flesh-eating bacteria is real. That's what grows in skin when it starts to rot. Flesh-eating bacteria is a big damn deal. I've had friends that have almost had fingers amputated from that shit. 
okay? <laughs> Don't mess around. I'm also saying it's possible to monitor your hides that way and to use taste as a viable tool to both learn vegetable tanning by learning how to monitor how much tannin levels change according to a tanning hide um, and also just to keep an eye on your skins because I'm the living proof, okay? After long enough, you won't really need to taste so much or much at all because you'll just, you'll just, you'll know the rhythms. You'll just kind of like, like anything, you just, you'll, it'll just be in your bones. You'll get a feel for it. Not to say that hides don't throw curveballs. They do all the time. They always will. That's why this craft is an alchemy. Um, yeah, so, you know, if it's like a squirrel, hair on, or like one domestic rabbit, hair on, and you have a five-gallon bucket filled at least halfway with really, really, really strong solution in the beginning, you likely won't need to strengthen that solution at all for the whole duration of that skin tanning, which will probably be about a week because the skin is so small anyway that yes, it will eat up a lot of the tannins, but there will still be so many tannins in there at the end that you don't have to worry about it. That's a good way to go about it. Um, obviously, if it's like a bigger hair on hide, like a coyote or a sheep or something, um, you know, you can't do that. You gotta like keep refreshing the tannins some way. And there's many ways to do that. Many, many ways. Okay. Another piece of that is this is a good, um, a good reason to not stuff a whole bunch of fur hides in one bucket. Okay. I urge you, I urge you, especially when you're learning, but even once you think you're a pro, because you're never a pro at tanning, it's always going to kick your butt and throw you curveballs and send you into existential crises because they're natural processes. And high tanning is hard. It's tough, okay? They send me fucking curveballs all the time. It's probably why I'm a little crazy, you know? Like, not for one second have I ever experienced, like, oh yeah, I got this all covered. High tanning, super smooth. Got it all figured out. Fuck no, not for one minute have I ever felt that way. And I don't expect to ever feel that way. Still, um, when you're learning or when you think you're a pro, don't put, 10, don't put 10 bunny hides in one five gallon bucket of tanning solution. Don't even put five in there. Don't even put four. Put one, start with one, okay? If you're learning and you really feel confident and you're getting the hang of it, put two. You can put two in there. Two domestic rabbit hides in one five gallon bucket full of extra strong tanning solution. Okay. Uh, because here's the thing. If you have one hide, one rabbit fur in a bucket of solution, it's absorbing tannins at its own rate. Okay. If you have two hides in there, the rate in which the hides are absorbing tannins doubles. That means that you have to replenish the tannins in the solution twice as much. You know, what if like once a day you're replenishing tannins? You have two hides in there, all of a sudden twice a day you need to replenish tannins. If you have six hides in there, your tannin the concentration of tannins in your solution is decreasing six times as quickly. That's a big damn deal. Okay, so that, so putting too many hides in one bucket of solution is a recipe for having your hair slip and fall out because it is a recipe for your tannin levels all of a sudden dipping much faster than you anticipated. And shit, you don't have any new fresh solution made to strengthen it. You're like, oh God. And maybe by the time you realize that the solution is weak, some of the furs are already starting to shed a little bit. And you're like, oh God, no. And you're panicking and you're like, oh, but I don't have solution. I gotta go boil some, but it's not even gonna be ready until the next day. You know, it's a shit storm. Don't put yourself in that situation, okay? I have put myself in that situation so many times as a learning fur tanner. I was in that situation. It's terrible what it does to your nerves. Fucking stresses you out, okay? I know that place, okay? So, oh, yeah, just don't do it. Don't do it. 
err on the side of tanning one hide at a time. And then you'll get like one hide that will go well and you'll soften it and you'll have like an endorphin hide. She's like, yes, it worked, how amazing, the hide is so beautiful and your confidence will rise and you'll be learning and then you'll tan another one and if it goes well, it'll be like, yes. But if you get greedy and you have like a pile of these frozen furs and you're like, oh, I just envision a pile of tan furs. It's gonna be so great. Shove them all in solution, right? Because you're like, I wanna get them all done. You've already put all the work into fleshing those hides, drying them. I mean, all the work you've already put into those hides is a lot. It's a big investment of your time, of your emotional energy, of your uh, physical work. If you have all 10 of those hides freaking rot, it's all for naught. Don't do that. It's stupid. It's totally stupid. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yes, I encourage you with furs. Put that fur hide in a bucket or a tub of extra strong tanning solution and make sure that hide has just got tons of space. Like it can just float around. It has just more tannins than it could ever eat up. That's a happy fur hide. Okay, that's a very happy fur hide. Okay, um, and another piece of that is like agitation. Like agitate that hide every day if you can. It's part of the joy of vegetable tanning is checking on hides every day. So you like go out and say, ooh, first thing in the morning, how are the buckets doing? How are the hides doing? They change every day. So it's part of the magic process. And you know, you go in there and you check on them. And to check on them, I like to pull them out. I kind of look at them. I squeeze them out really, really well, slosh them back around, put them back in. That's great. Okay, because that's making sure that like, if there's a bunch of hides all kind of laying in the solution and they all kind of get crumpled at the bottom, there will be pockets of solution that might become weaker and that kind of get stuck. So you might have these stagnant pockets of um, weak solution in there. And that's a recipe for hair loss too, you know? You just, you want full strength solution to be able to be circulating all around that hide, constantly bombarding and in contact with that skin. That's a happy fur hide. That's some good vegetable tan, okay? So the next part of this is your membrane again. This is so important. I can't tell you how important this is, okay? It's another membraning step. I call this wet membraning. So I kind of call, I kind of call this step dry membraning because you're I'm using a stone on a dried hide and kind of buffing off the membrane dried. This step I call wet membraning because I'm doing it to a wet sloppy hide. Those are just the terms that make sense to me. Okay. So, um, let's see. Um, yeah, if, if, for those who are on Patreon, um, I just did a great little demo of wet membraning on a squirrel. So that was on the process video number four, where I'm really showing close up what I'm doing to wet membrane the skin. Um, in general, what that is, is a final membraning step, where after one day, really just after one night in tannin solution, I'm taking the hide back out and I'm doing one last membraning step. Okay, so if I put that rabbit skin in tannin solution one day, the next morning, ideally, I'm taking out that hide and uh, membraning it. Okay, because often there will be some membrane that will stay on that hide that long. You know, as, as, as great of a job, as great of a job as you do fleshing the hide, and then as great of a job as you do dry membraning the hide, often there's still going to be a little bit of membrane stuck on there. 
particularly if it's domestic rabbits. They are notorious. They're the only animal I know that has multiple layers of membrane that all together, if you add them all up, often they are greater in thickness than the core fibers of the skin. That's why they're very difficult. They're very tricky hides. So don't feel bad if they have messed you up. They're tricky because of all those layers of really tough membrane and because the hides are delicate and they're easy to rip. So those two factors together make them quite an arch worm. But you can get there. They're, they're amazing hides. They're some of my favorite fur hides. I think they're fabulous and underappreciated. So wet membraning. The second morning, okay, taking out those hides, squeezing them out really well, you'll be able to see some of the remaining membrane that you couldn't see the day before because as soon as the tannins hit the membrane, they're going to color it and so they'll stand out. And as soon as the tannins hit the membrane just a little bit and start to tan, once the tannins have hit the membrane a little bit and started to tan it a little bit, the membrane will then be much more willing to start to separate from the core fiber layer underneath and you'll be able to get it off um, when you couldn't get it off before. Okay. Um, and I'm usually using a buffing stone, like I said. So wet membraning is extremely important because, like I mentioned about membrane before, if there are little bits of membrane left on that hide or big old patches of membrane, those sections of the skin are going to take a lot longer to tan. They're going to be more resistant to tanning because the membrane acts as a barrier to, to greatly slow down. It doesn't block, but to greatly slow down the tannins from penetrating all the way through the full width of the fibers of the hide. Okay, so Morning number two, when you take out that hide and do a nice thorough job wet membraning it, then all of a sudden that skin is just a nice, clear, open surface, okay? So what has happened is you've removed the membrane or broken up the membrane so much that it's kind of in shreds, and you've also kind of roughed up the surface of the core fiber layer also. So the fibers are just like roughed up, to me, to me, like they're roughed up and they're just like ready for tannins. They're just ready to like suck them, like suck the tannins all in really quickly. Okay, so after you've wet membraned a hide, that hide is going to tan quickly. Okay, because the membrane is, is gone. Okay, so there's no barrier to those tannins getting all the way through the skin. And the hide will tan evenly. Okay, it'll tan swiftly and evenly. And that's what you want, is for that hide to just tan quickly from there on out. So, like I said, I'm very strict about wet membraning fur hides on day two. Don't wait till, I mean, don't wait till day three. Don't do it. Just make a rule. I'm very strict about that. It's one of the things I'm most strict about with tanning. One is keeping the solutions very strong if they're fur hides. And two is, is wet membraning on day two. They're really important. You know, like, prioritize it. I get stressed out if I, like, am not on top of that. So I organize my life around those steps. Okay, wet membraning, so important. I mean, this is why, I mean, my god, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen, especially rabbit furs, vegetable tanned by folks, where um, they tanned the hides completely and like maybe it took months, like they were in some bark solution for months and then they took them out and softened them and the hides are like tanned but they're just like kind of stiff, like they're not like real supple, floppy, thin layer, thin leather and it's because, I mean I've held these hides where they, some of them can have a completely intact layer of membrane over the entire hide, like the entire membrane is intact and tanned and still stuck on the hide. So yes, like the tannins did penetrate through the membrane. The tannins tanned the membrane, tanned through it, then tanned through all the core fibers underneath it. So the whole hide did tan. It took a lot longer, likely. But then when they go to soften the hide, because the membrane is still intact, 
the hide can't soften fully, okay? Because membrane has a different structure than core fibers. Membrane is tighter. So um, you'll notice when you soften a hide, if there's little bits of membrane still on there, when you're softening the hide, if you're abrading the surface of the leather, those little bits of membrane will kind of break apart from each other like continents in an ocean. They'll move apart because the whole hide underneath is stretching. The whole hide is increasing in shape because as you're softening the hide, the core fibers, which started out maybe like this, you're moving them apart, moving them apart, moving them apart until at the end, you know, they have all these air pockets in between them. You really move them far apart from one another. That's what makes leather floppy and breathable and supple, okay? But when there's membrane on top of a hide, membrane won't do that. Membrane won't stretch. It kind of likes to stay tight. So if the membrane is tight, then the core, fiber, the core fibers underneath can't stretch out. So your hide is just not gonna fully soften. Your hide is gonna stay kind of smaller in size and you're not gonna get the same degree of floppiness and softness as you would if all the, if all the membrane was either removed or thoroughly broken up. So getting membrane off is a really big deal. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a, an issue a lot of people run into, especially when they're starting off. Number five, really important, kind of goes along with number one. You know guys, I'm just gonna tell you, I vegetable tan furs pretty much exclusively in the cold half of the year. So late autumn, mid to late autumn, through winter, through early spring. In the cold, okay? So that means that my tannin solutions are always cool or cold in temperature. They're not warm or hot. I consider that a really big deal. It's a big deal. And it, it did take me years to, it took me years to truly appreciate how much the coldness helps you as a vegetable tanner when you're vegetable tanning furs. Um, it's a big deal. You know, science, science would say, okay, a hide, sh the, the speed at which a hide should tan should depend on number one, the concentration of tannins in the solution. Because like I said, the more tannin molecules in there moving around, the greater the frequency at which they are going to be coming into contact with the hide. Right? So mathematically, we can imagine that makes sense, mathematically. Number two would be temperature, right? Because molecules tend to move more quickly in warmer temperatures, and molecules tend to move more slowly in colder temperatures, right? So if you imagine tannin molecules moving around, an aqueous solution moving around, uh, water molecules, we would expect them to move slowly in the cold and therefore contact the skin less frequently because they're like, oh, it's moving. Oh, it hit the hide. Oh, another one's moving. Oh, it hit the hide. And we would expect in warm temperatures the molecules to be like buzzing around, buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. And because they're moving so much faster, they would be contacting the skin much more frequently and therefore tanning the hide faster. So mathematically, scientifically, that's what we would expect. That's what I expected. In real life, in practice, I have not experienced that to play out as truth. Okay, so yes, one would expect hides to tan more quickly in the warmth and more slowly in the cold. However, in real life, I really don't see it playing out that way. And I was surprised by that. You know, I did a lot of experiments over the years because I wanted to see hides tan faster in the heat in order to maybe satisfy 
the scientific mathematical part of my brain. But the results were not that, were not that way. Um, for me, the strength of the tannin solution has more of an effect than any other factor on the speed at which a hide tans. In all my experience, the strength of the solution is supreme in importance of determining how fast a hide tans. So when I'm tanning for hides in very cold weather, you know, even if like my buckets are like freezing a little on the surface every night, or the buckets are so damn cold that when I reach my hands in there to take them out, like my just hands are in pain, like all winter long, I'm like, just, my hands are just fucking frozen. And I'm like, well, maybe it'll keep me from getting arthritis when I'm older. Maybe this is good, you know, but it's painful. Um, the hides are still tanning quickly for me, even in very cold solution, if the solution is strong. Um, what I do find is that when I'm tanning in st with strong solutions in the cold weather, and following all these other guidelines, I simply pretty much never experience hair slipping or hair loss on a hide. That's interesting to me. Even though the hide is tanning just as fast as if it were in the hot weather, whereas in the summertime, when the temperatures are warm and the tannin solutions are quite warm, I have often experienced hair slippage on hides even when I'm following all these other steps that I'm being so careful and thorough like still the hair is just falling out and I'm like no but the solution is so strong I can't even make it any stronger I've done everything else perfectly why is the hair slipping I don't know I don't know um, and I have vegetable tanned fur hides in the warm weather that have turned out great with no hair slipping but I do find that it's a real gamble. I do find that the risk of fur hide slipping hair to me significantly goes up if I'm tanning them in the warm weather. And I can't tell you why. Scientifically, it doesn't quite make sense, but that's reality. That's a big deal. So, yeah. Pretty much, if it's my choice, if it's all under my power, I'm only vegetable tanning fur hides during the cold season. Cool or cold season. And I'm in the southeast and mid-Atlantic a lot. It doesn't get super cold here. So to me, um, you know, even if the temperatures are like in the 50s, it's great. It's usually still great. Um, once the temperatures start to get into like the 60s, that's kind of the in-between zone. It's getting warm. 70 degrees is like, all right, it's warm now. You know, 80s and 90s, forget about it. Um, but even if the temperatures outside are like 40s and 50s, great, great for tanning weather. That's great for me, for me at least. Um, so yeah, sometimes like during the winter time, Obviously, it's so cold that hide buckets will freeze solid. And you don't really want that because your hides are not going to make any progress tanning if they're frozen solid. It's not going to hurt the hides to freeze, but you're just going to be sitting on your butt waiting for them to thaw again so that they will continue tanning. It's a pain in the butt. So um, I have found it's great for me to just like put, put the tanning buckets like in a root cellar or shed, um, or garage, or some place that's like um, going to be the underground temperature so that they'll stay just above freezing and they won't freeze solid. So yeah, if you have a house that's like partially underground or a basement or a cellar, yeah, or a garage or just some place where they're going to stay, like where you would store root vegetables and canned goods and stuff like that. Um, goodness gracious. Yeah. 
tan furs in the cold for so many reasons. For one, picking up roadkill is so much better. The hides are fresher. The meat is fresher. The fur hides are thicker because the animal's coats are thicker. So your hides are going to come out nicer anyway. And vegetable tanning is just a breeze in the cold weather. And there's no flies to annoy the crap out of you when you're flushing your hides and when you're trying to dry hides and salted hides. Flies are a pain in the freaking ass in the hot weather. They will lay eggs all inside your fur if you're not constantly paying attention or smoking them out. So everything about the cold season is just fur season. It's just that special time of year. Celebrate it. Okay. Yeah, vegetable tan in the cold. Vegetable tan furs in the cold. If you're vegetable tanning hair off leather, shit, you can do that any time of year. Middle of summer, no problem. I mean, hair off leather is even like, if, you're, if you forget about your hide for a week or two weeks and the tannin concentration of tannins dips down to like almost zero, you're still fine. Like, <laughs> Tan vegetable tanning hair off leather is just so chill. I mean, yes, there's a lot of ways to mess it up, but like for somebody like me who just like knows the ropes of tanning, like hair off leather is just like, it's almost like there's no way to fuck it up. Like it's just so chill. Whereas furs are like, you gotta be like on your toes. Really use all your skills with fur tanning. And then with hair off leather, I'm just like, oh, time to relax. Enjoy life. Take it easy. Okay. Uh, obvious, maybe not obviously, um, this does not apply to brain tanning furs. You know, I will happily brain tan furs in the warm weather. It's actually nicer for me to brain tan furs in the warm weather because sun or a wood stove. Wood stoves are great too. But, you know, some heat source is just so nice for softening brain tanned furs. So this really just applies to vegetable tanning furs because your furs are sitting in liquid for days or weeks at a time, right? <laughs> it's a recipe for rot. That's how things rot. Um, and instead, amazingly, we're transforming them into leather. This stuff just shouldn't even be real. But it is. It's magic. It's real life alchemy on planet Earth. Okay, so yes, I could pull out other nitpicky things, you know, in terms of my process with furs, but really, these are the main points, okay? So I stick to all of these when vegetable tanning furs, and then, you know, things just go smoothly. It's just enjoyable, and the hides turn out nice, okay? It's just a smoother more sensible journey, okay? Only choosing to tan the fur hides where the hair is really tight and fresh and nice to begin with. Don't waste your time. 100% of the time, I am always drying fur hides first. And I am thoroughly dry membraning them, AKA dry buffing them. I am using strong tannin solution from beginning to end and being very conscientious about that. I am never forgetting to do the final wet membraning step on day two in solution. So important. And on vegetable tanning furs in the cold weather, um, for the most part. So those are my tips. Um, if you, you know, wanna try pickling, you know, by all means, try it out. I just can't teach it to you because I don't do it. Um, and it will require you buying a lot more products like vin like tons and tons of vinegar or citric acid or maybe you can use acetic acid. I don't know, I don't do it. But you need to find a recipe. You can't just wing it. You need to find a recipe and follow it and buy all the products for it. Um, but if you, you know, if you're not following any of these steps and you're having hair falling out and you're like, oh, well, I've heard I should just pickle hides to keep the hair from falling out. Bullshit. Like, do it right first. Do all the right, correct steps first. If you're still having problems, 
yeah, why not try pickling? Um, but just try this first. It's simple. It means that for me, like, I don't need any special products to vegetable tan furs. You know, like, I do buy salt as a convenience. It's not necessary. And every once in a while, I'll buy, like, a little olive oil if I'm out of animal lards. That's it. <laughs> how awesome. Like, how great. All the other ingredients are just the wild plants, the tannic plants harvested by hand, and the animal fats rendered by hand, and all the tools that you can make yourself. So, I think that's high class shit. <laughs> all right, I hope this was helpful. Um, any of the resources that I mentioned, I will put in the description below. Let me know how you think. If you are watching this on YouTube or something like that and you are enjoying this and you don't already know, um, you can become a supporter of these videos by supporting me on Patreon, which would be so lovely and so helpful. Um, all these free videos I put out, you can, if you like them, if you enjoy them, if you're learning from them and you just want to say thank you, you can become like a $2 a month supporter on my Patreon, which just really like encourages me to keep putting these out because um, it's an enormous amount of labor that's really not practical, but I'm doing it. Um, and if you find all this stuff helpful and you'd like more videos every month, you can join the higher tier on Patreon and get access to more videos I put out every month, which do cover all topics like plants and and hides and other things, but it, there's a lot of tanning stuff. Um, so right now there is already a lot of what I call process videos on there where I'm just like, you know, going through tanning the hides that I'm tanning in my real life and showing you close up and kind of zooming in on a lot of the steps and folding in a lot of these lessons along the way in real life in real time as they make sense. So. So far, it seems like from feedback, they've been they've been helpful for folks, and um, I think they're really rich. So check it out. Head on over there if you would like. Uh, Patreon.com slash Storms of Daylight. That's the only, Patreon is the only support I have for all this video work, which the hours and the time are quite immense. Um, but I do hope they're helping and inspiring. And that's all for now. You can be an amazing fur tanner. Just don't listen to the men tanners. Ignore them. Shut your... Turn a blind eye.